Hello, everybody. Welcome to Drunk with Questions. I'm Gooch. And I'm Raj. Join us as we navigate the complexities of life. Here, alcohol may not be the answer, but it sure as hell worth a shot. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Drunk with Questions, the talk show where ordinary people talk about extraordinary topics. <clears throat> with me today is Raj, Spicy, and Tim. Hey, what's going on, guys? Ugh. Well, I have to apologize to the viewers today, but I am sick, unfortunately. Very sick. Uh, so, yeah. I don't know if the uh, the stuffy nose gives me more of a sultry voice or what. So. I don't <laughs> want a bunch of... Yeah, something voice. It gives a something voice, yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't want a bunch seductive. of love letters. Le- love letters. <laughs> All right. We'll just move on. It what it is. So, Everybody send love letters, please. Yeah, we're not letting him uh, lick the uh, adhesive on the return envelopes. Don't worry. <laughs> it's why he's sick. <laughs> It'd be like a form of bioterrorism. <laughs> That's how we get recognized. <laughs> Small podcast group <laughs> charged with bioterrorism. Oh, uh, the headlines. Your FBI agent's watching you right now. Hey, man, all publicity is good publicity. <laughs> <laughs> He's getting lumped in with all the other eco terrorists and yep. biological terrorists out there. Well, what speaking of eco terrorism, we got an interesting one for uh, the the group today. The drunk with questions crew. The thought experiment. Well, yeah, I guess we can t- get started with that for people that haven't heard yet, because it's only episode two of season two. Um, instead of me burning Raj every start of the episode. Uh, we are going to do thought experiments. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I yeah, they're fun, but we do enjoy the sweet, sweet roast of Raj. Yeah. <laughs> so today, uh, we have Spicy bringing it to us. So Spicy's going to pose the question, and we're just going to spend a little bit of time talking about it, kind of get our minds, you know, worked out for the uh, the actual topic. So Spicy, take it away. All right, so kind of looking up some thought experiments. Uh, so this one was uh, written by a famed utilitarian thinker, so Peter Singer back in 20, 2009. So the premise goes, imagine you're walking down a street and you notice a child drowning in a lake. You can swim and you're close enough to save the child if you act immediately. However, if you do it, it's going to ruin your expensive shoes. Do you still have an obligation to save the child? So Singer, his opinion was, yes, you do have a responsibility to save the child because the cost is no object, price is no object. But agreeing with him leads to a question that if you're obligated to save the life of the child in need right in front of you, is there a fundamental difference between saving the child in front of you and one that needs your help on the other side of the world? I like this question. So it's a, it's a deeply philosophical one. Um We're looking at the idea of saving the child in front of you being no different from saving the child on the other side of the planet. But I think there is a fundamental difference because the actions that you can take right then and there can save a life. And you, it's the act, it's the choice of doing something to save a life in front of you instead of walking away. And I, I think as humans, like when you see a child in danger, you're more likely to act. It's almost like a, uh, something that's ingrained in you like it, it comes out of just you when when something like that is presents itself that you really don't have any control over it I think it's almost like an evolutionary trait for us to protect our young and it doesn't even matter if it's our young or somebody else's if we see a child in danger your tendency is to act and I I, I, I believe that you're more likely to act if it's a child versus another adult and uh, I just believe that's just part of our evolutionary process and how we are as a species we're going to protect that child no matter what. Now, whether or not it equates to the same as saving a child across the, on the other side of the world, I mean, both are great. But if you don't act in that moment, I feel like you have no right to be doing anything anywhere else. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with the route, though, that you absolutely do not have um, uh, any obligation to help anybody. Honestly, um, <clears throat> although I do agree with what Raj is saying, which is, you know, it's innate that you would want to most people at least. Right. And I'm not saying that I wouldn't help, but I don't believe 
in any sense of the word that there's any obligation. So at the end of the day, humans are animalistic, right? If a zebra gets attacked by the crocodile, most of the time, the other zebras aren't coming back to save the one. Sometimes you'll see some, but most of the times they're not coming back. It's, it is what it is, gone to the wind. So I don't believe we have an obligation <clears throat> at all. Okay, that's an interesting way. So, so you're basically saying almost like an animalistic survival of the fittest kind of scenario where even though, but here's my argument. Self-preservation and survival of the fittest. Yeah. Now, now it doesn't say that you don't know how to swim, so you're not in any danger for trying to attempt to save that child. No, no, so I know, but I'm just saying. If that child was being mauled by a lion. Well, yeah, I'm not doing it. Sorry, you're not bro. doing it. No, But if I the kid's lose. drowning, this is not like a, a scenario where you are in danger of drowning or you're in danger of getting mauled by the animal instead of the child you know it, it's the case of you can you save the child from drowning if the situation was the child is being attacked by something dangerous that could kill you then the parameters change because at that point you're like it's either self-preservation or giving yourself up to save the child you know there's there's different factors that come into play there but you're gonna act if it's just a simple matter as saving a drowning child i just don't think we as humans are obligated to do to save it you know i don't think anyone is obligated to do anything honestly isn't it an obligation for the species it's the same reason that when a baby cries we have this innate sense it's almost ingrained in us the the baby crying is supposed to be super annoying and super anxiety inducing for us is because that's what's ingrained in us no i know but it's just, I think I'm hung up on the obligation part. I am not obligated to save your child. I'm not, and I'm not saying I wouldn't do it. I probably would personally, depending on the situation. But just as a, as another human to another human, there is no obligation. And there's really no laws, frankly, that force you to save somebody's life. Most of the time, 911 will tell you not to do anything and just wait for emergency help, you know? <clears throat> but do yeah, you believe out. that that would lead to society falling apart? We generally go with don't put yourself in danger when someone else is in danger. Go ahead, Spicy. Well, that's kind of where I'll jump in on it too. So, I mean, like you kind of made a point into what I was going to say. So, I mean, it comes down to what people believe an obligation means. So, like you pointed out, uh, Gooch, that there's no legal obligation that compels anybody to have to intervene. There are certain circumstances where due to a job that you do have a duty to intervene, you are legally obligated to do so. Not always. Even police officers aren't always obligated to intervene in something. But the there becomes different kind of obligations, I think. So now you have either a societal obligation based on the rules of your society or you have a, a moral obligation, kind of that personal obligation. So it there's different levels of it. You're not going to be held legally accountable for it because there's nothing compelling you to do so. But you come down to more of the moral obligations and that personal, like you said, you would probably do it. Like you're not saying you wouldn't, but is, are people obligated to do so? Um, no, I mean, like on a legal sense, no. And I think that's what a lot of people think of in today's world they think of things in terms of a legal obligation and not necessarily we in my opinion we've kind of lost as a society our sense of like civic and civil obligations to each other and moral obligations um i think overall in our society and i, I don't know if you guys tend to agree the sense of community that was built in our relationships uh, has deteriorated over time and we've become more of an individual focused society rather than a group focused society. I mean, I think we see that happen even in our own lives. Like, um, I mean, when we saw something that happens, like when, when people would rather videotape something than rather than act when something's happening in front of them, like, especially, I mean, we saw it with what happened with police officers with George Floyd and the incident there where basically the guy is on the ground screaming for his mom, telling them he can't breathe. And because they're police officers, we just assume that they're always right and we don't act or the people there didn't pull the police officers off because they were afraid of something happening to them and they just videotaped. And I'm, I'm glad they videotaped because I mean, it eventually led to the prosecution of these people, but 
it's the lack of act. How many people will see an accident happen and then they'll just drive past it or take a video of it without actually getting out to check if the person's okay? Pretty sure and... there's a study <clears throat> that a university in New York did. They had two actors set up in an alleyway in New York City and the girl was like screaming saying she was being raped or whatever. And it was only like one in 10 people did anything about it. The rest well, and this was... falls into this falls into psychology. It's known as the bystander effect. So the bystander effect essentially is this psychological phenomena that as people, it kind of fits with what you were saying, Gooch, this self-preservation type instinct, or it's not even that a lot of times. It's just the phenomena that we as bystanders will sometimes like we'll just ignore something or somebody that needs assistance because we think that there's somebody else that will help them, whether it be a first responder coming or another individual that we think is more capable than us, or just, I don't want to get involved in that. I don't want to be, you know, go to court on it, be hurt, anything, whatever the, like the motivation is behind it. You think that somebody else will help them. So you ignore it. And unfortunately that keeps happening. And which is why things continue to go on longer and longer in these situations because people are experiencing that bystander effect. What do you think, Tim? Yeah, what do you think, Tim? Sorry, man. Not really dive that deep into this one. Personally, like, yeah, I'd help the child. Just as a moral obligation. Um, you know, what the second part of it was, where we listening to all this, like, we were still talking about uh, ruining your like expensive shoes. Is that still part of that? It is, yeah. Yeah, so like, yeah, I mean, shoes are replaceable, right? It's just a material good. And um, so, yeah, I think I would definitely save the drowning child because it's something that I can directly impact in front of me. As far as on a global stance, I don't feel any obligation to help somewhere else where I'm not making the direct impact. Just like, you know, you go to the grocery store and they're like, hey, would you like to round up to the nearest dollar to donate to this organization? Nope. You know why? Because that's a tax write-off for that company. Right, like if I want to donate to the organization, I'll donate directly to the organization. Why help a multi-million-dollar company meet their tax write-offs? Right, so that's you know doesn't really matter what organization it is. If you want to really make an impact, either you directly going in and trying to do something positive and make some change, versus just oh yeah. It's easy because I'll just round up the whatever odd change to the next dollar and you guys can donate it. Well, that usually doesn't go much further than that. Um, so, yeah, I think like taking out all the legal aspects of it, you know, because there's the Good Samaritan law, even if you went in there and got the kid and they got injured or whatever, you're still protected. Most areas. Um, and one of those things that goes into more of um, uh, blanking on the word for it. Um, just your like personal integrity. Like even if nobody's watching you, right? There's just this kid drowning in a river. Let's say you're going on a hike and this kid decided to sneak out of the backyard or whatever, right? Like you're st- yeah, you should still do something because kids, for whatever reason, naturally gravitate towards water. Right? Like, it doesn't matter where you are. They just, like, if there's a pool in the backyard, they'll find it. If there's a river, if you're on a uh, lake I'm house. I need you to cite sources on that, Timothy. <laughs> I mean, the number of drownings kind of speaks for itself. <laughs> but it's just one of those <laughs> things, like, yeah, so, you know, survival of the fittest can play a part in the animal world right just recently there is a um i mean elephants are just incredible animals to begin with but there is a female elephant who um her calf fell down into a drainage ditch like a culvert and the calf couldn't get out so she climbed halfway down there so her calf could still milk and then she ended up getting stuck, but then, you know, the rescuers ended up finding them and saved both of them. But 
her natural instinct. She knew something was wrong. Her calf needed to be fed, so she even put her own life at risk to try and feed her calf without the full understanding of the implications. You know, she didn't really have any forethought on that. Like, all right, if I get in this hole, how do I get out? Elephants also have like a gigantic uh, vested interest in their children. I mean, yeah. the gestation period's like 18 months. Well, even I mean, <laughs> gazelles do child... the same thing. Gazelles yeah. do it, and then you have like any of these larger mammals, um, buffalo. They'll surround primates. the entire children in the middle while the adults are outside protecting it from any yeah. danger. So it's it's a, it's, a, it's a community effort to save these kids. Like, because I one of the things that we talked about before about, um, or maybe we didn't cover. I talked to somebody else about was the community effect of raising a child where it's not just your parents that are responsible for you, but the entire community looks out for you. Like where I come from, that's generally how kids are raised, where everybody, if I'm in the neighborhood and doing something stupid, somebody from the neighborhood is going to see me and they're going to tell my parents or they're going to come in and police me. And so there's like, there's a, there's a general safety. We don't worry about some outsider coming into our neighborhood and doing something to the kids because everyone's usually watching everyone's kids. But maybe that's lost on the newer generation where it's more of a, a family where you're worried about your own kids. I'll worry about mine and for, we'll look the other way for a lot of families though. It seems like they're not even worried about their own kids. Kids are kind well, of think... raising themselves in a lot of areas or aspects. the internet's raising these kids. Yeah. That's what's happening. The oh, internet sure. is teaching the kids everything that the parents should be teaching them, but it's now coming from an unfiltered source with no direction or no, no, no gar guiding voice in it well it sounds like we're moving into our topic so I, i'll say we'll cut off the thought experiment there <clears throat> because for the listeners who don't know our topic today is the woke movement <clears throat> now everyone has their own personal viewpoints on w wokeness and i think everyone also has their own uh, idea of what what is wokeness and what is more I'm trying to be careful of how I say this possibly mental disease how about that mental illness um, <clears throat> so although we're probably gonna have some tough conversation here especially for some of our viewers or other people uh, just understand that we're not attempting to you know, hurt anyone's feelings or belittle them or make them feel like they're unimportant. Um, we're simply just bringing wokeness into the limelight. And that's what we've always done in this podcast, right? We're not here to judge anybody for anything. We're trying to bring this topic into the limelight, shine the flashlight directly on it, and really try to dissect it and understand it. Um, we all have different opinions in this uh here at Drunk With Questions. <clears throat> so we ask that as much as we respect each other, you respect us as well. With that, um, I think the biggest issue with wokeness is that it was built on good foundation and then they used rickety scrap metal to build everything else around it, right? So not for one second am I gonna say that the original ideas behind it, the, the Me Too movement, everything like that, wasn't correct. Um, I know that there were probably a lot of women in Hollywood that were hiding sexual assault because they were afraid that they would be ostracized from, you know, Hollywood because of it. <clears throat> but do I think nowadays that there are plenty of females that are taking advantage of it? Absolutely. I really do um, probably making up stories as well and that's unfortunate and we don't have laws right now that protect people from that because you can say whatever you want if you're a female or a male if you're a, a sexual assault victim um, and then if it comes out to nothing happened you basically maybe get a slap on the wrist there's really no punishment so um, <clears throat> I think that would kind of be where I would start with wokeness is the Me Too movement. 
So let, let's start with the definition of woke for those of you that are listening and don't really know what it means. Maybe it doesn't exist in your part of the world. Maybe it's more of a societal thing here in America. So the actual definition based on Marion Webster, the dictionary is an awareness of an active or being actively attentive to important social facts and issues, especially issues that have to do with racial and social justice. Now, the definition by itself, it's not that bad of a thing. It's just you being attentive to what's going on in the world and kind of calibrating yourself to Strong the foundation. changes. Yeah. yeah, just having just having an understanding of what's actually going on in the world. But I feel like there's a, a wash in where everything gets called woke, where the, the actual terminology is lost. Its definition is morphed into some kind of monster where, you know, if you don't agree with someone on something, you're not woke. If you believe something differently from them, you're not woke. If you have even a similar take but a different end theory on something, you're not woke. So the issue with that, the, this whole woke movement is there's no structured idea, idea of what actually woke is. So people on the left side call it, say that the liberal, that the conservatives aren't woke, and then the conservatives say that the liberals aren't woke. It's basically nobody has an idea of what actually is going on here. So I think it's it's morphed into some kind of internet demon that's pretty much haunting us now. In, in my sense, that it, this definition for woke is not a bad thing. Being attentive to what's going on in society and calibrating yourself to, to match, because society is a fluid thing. Everything changes in society. Things that are okay now were not okay 50 years ago. There are things that change and become society, societally acceptable to, to do or to say. And sometimes it goes the reverse. It becomes less acceptable to say certain things. And that's just how society functions. But if we use woke as a weapon, it, it turns into something we like to call cancel culture, which is the biggest problem that I have with the woke movement is the canceling of people for ideas that are different from yours. Now, I'm not going to say that you can't call somebody an idiot for believing something. This is, this is America. You can say and do whatever you want. You have the freedom of speech, but you do not have the freedom of escaping the consequence of that speech. You will have to deal with it. But in that light, when you're talking about people being canceled for saying something or saying something even 10 years ago, and you're trying to cancel them now, it just doesn't sit well with me. Um, cancel culture has kind of gotten ridiculous in what it's trying to do. The moment you say something, everyone joins the bandwagon. I mean, when you when this stuff can affect your job, can affect your livelihood, can affect your reputation, um, and everyone's walking around on pins and needles trying to figure out what they can and can't say. It's a, it's a huge problem for society because I feel like we could no longer have freedom of speech. And the idea, the whole idea of our government is that all people have a voice, no matter what their opinion is. And we take that voice, we put it to a vote and you make a decision on it. And I feel like that doesn't happen anymore. Now it's just smear campaigns left and right on who's right and who's wrong. So that's my understanding of woke. Um, if you guys have something different, please let me know. I mean, I'd say that I agree with a lot of that. I mean, to kind of what I was thinking when you were going through your explanation of it, I think that term and the, the action behind it has kind of been weaponized against people, essentially, like you said, that have a differing opinion than others or disagree with something, maybe not in the, uh, the way it's done, but the outcomes. And it's one of those things where, um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the saying, like you said, you know, oh, well, you're not woke enough or you're not, they, they, that's not woke, like you're just stuck in the past. It's like, no, I mean, they have a different opinion and, you know, it's it's worth hearing different opinions. But unfortunately, we live in a day and age where it seems like there's a lot of people that aren't interested in coming together, kind of like what we're doing and having these conversations with differing opinions because you can't sharpen your own knowledge unless you're exposed to something that contradicts what you believe or you know. So if you just constantly just have stuff that confirms what you already know, then you're not really challenging yourself to think critically or outside of the box. To, and that goes in both directions. It's one of those things where essentially you're basically just getting gaslighted the whole time where... Uh, and I'm not saying that you have to agree with the opposing ideas because I hear differing opinions all the time. I don't agree with them at all, but 
if I didn't get exposed to that, I would live in this insular bubble where everything was just what I had always believed it to be. And then if you get into that for too long, I'm a firm believer that you're going to have a very negative reaction when you come into the world and like get that pushback from differing opinions of your own. There's some people that they cannot handle that because they've never been exposed to it. The, um, and so, I mean, being, being aware of what's going on in society, being aware of what's going on in your communities, it's important. It doesn't mean that you have to agree with everything that everybody believes. I think it's, and I'm not saying that every movement that, or anything that goes into all of that is correct either. Cause I think there's a lot of hijacking going on of terms of movements of, you know, let me present it in this way and people are good with it. But then in reality, here's what we're doing over here. And it's like, no, that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, and so, and one of my favorite things too, that I heard, I forget who it was. I don't know if it was Ben Shapiro or somebody I first heard it from is I, me personally, especially being in like the law enforcement realm, the criminal justice sphere, potentially looking at going to law school in the future, haven't fully decided. Um, I don't, me personally, I don't like the term social justice because in, in all reality, like justice itself is supposed to be the concept of like the adage of justice is blind, whether people agree that that is true or not, obviously we're flawed people with an imperfect system, but the concept of justice is supposed to be doing what's right and punishing what's wrong. Like, so anytime that you qualify it with a different term of like economic justice, social justice, um, you know, environmental justice, to me, it almost kind of perverts the term in the sense that like you're trying to now reach a goal sometimes that maybe it's not what true justice is. And if that makes sense, if, if you're trying, I'm trying to explain it the best I can. Um, in, in my opinion, like justice should just be that, like it is what it is. It's supposed to be doing what's right and punishing what's wrong. And it doesn't really need to be qualified any other way. And that should apply to any situation. I don't need to put a different label on it. No, I completely get to what you're saying. Cause basically you're saying that the overarching narrative of justice is to protect and to stop bad things from happening it's supposed to be the equalizer and it's blind and we can all pretty much agree that it's it's not blind in this country as it sits right now there is definitely biases definitely things that come into place and that just has to do with us as human beings because we're not like spicy said we're not perfect our yeah, system's never, not perfect you're never going to find a, a area where that doesn't you know we have safeguards in place to try to make it as equitable as possible Mm -hmm. um you know and that's i think also too as a country i mean we we can jump into this a little more later but i mean there's a difference in this in society between a difference of equality of opportunity and equality of outcome mm -hmm. and so but i mean we we have these safeguards we try to be as impartial as we can regardless you know somebody may not have extreme biases but if anybody says that they are not biased to something they haven't done enough introspection because there is always something that is going to be a bias in your life based on your experiences. Go ahead, Tim. I want to hear your opening statements. Well, woke is an increase in sensitivity, emotional particularly, right? So uh, woke culture killed comedy. Um you know we can't make fun of ourselves we can't make fun of other people like we used to because everybody's super sensitive it is not an individual's responsibility to tiptoe around what some what might trigger someone else it is your responsibility to appropriately take care of something that triggers you no one else's um i think that's a really big thing because you know comedians they didn't care what aisle what side of the aisle you are on politically they didn't care what you look like you know i understand there are some things that are inappropriate to talk about or make fun of but if you know if you can't make fun of yourself you just lose it all you know you should be able to look at your flaws and be like oh yeah i can make fun of that right and move on with your life because you're an adult you've learned how to adjust to things that you may not like to hear or you may play in with it you know um i agree though that 
the original premise behind being woke and being open to different ideas and beliefs and everything you know kind of like what spicy and raj you know justice should be blind on the justice aspect of it right treat every treat your neighbor like you'd want to be treated um that even goes back into a biblical concept right to love your neighbor i'm pretty sure in different religions too and not 100 percent sure on that but essentially be a good person is what i'm getting at but at the same time don't force your opinion on someone else and then when they don't agree with you start throwing out names right name calling or racial group profiling or his you know treat everybody as an individual right instead of oh they didn't agree with me so they're x y or z well no because i think there's still good people out there but good people are using wokeness to do bad things or to justify bad things um right so and that's happened all throughout history but you know like most recently right so there's I, everybody knows the different police shootings that have been involved uh antifa i think was specifically a more violence organized group and most of the media doesn't show that but the billions of dollars in damage that they caused you know they're anti-fascist right but being anti-fascist in the way that they were trying to fight fascism was in fact itself fascist when you are shutting down opposing ideas you are a fascist instead of expressing them openly debating them without hurling names and insults the other group that quickly rose and disappeared was blm and i mean you can search multiple news outlets and see all the corruption that formed from that specific organization right like uh for example uh there was a gentleman who was an exec who ended up stealing 10 million dollars in donor funds um from the uh, black lives matter global network foundation uh, you know, these people used tragedy for personal gain. And I think that is, it could have been a good person who then exploited an opportunity. Um, I think, you know, but then nobody's really calling out those individuals or even education system introducing certain types of curriculum that are being kind of forced onto our kids in one sense or another without really any oversight, right? Some of this curriculum is just kind of being implemented by school boards and then parents find out about it and they rightfully are angry you know, whatever it may be, it's like, we should be teaching our children, you know, all your basic stuff that you learn through elementary school, right? I specifically don't think that you should be teaching an elementary child about sexual education. I think that's a completely inappropriate thing. There's a time and a place for that. And I definitely think that those conversations specifically should be left to the parents. Uh, it's not the government's job to dictate what happens in your bedroom or to teach children about things that they don't need to know children are very impressionable and that's where also the wokeness kind of slipped into the education system i mean as far as from political ideologies to um gender identities you know i think I think the world is laughing at us in America, right? You look at some other countries that are focused on science, mathematics as a core to education, and they are far outpacing the United States in standardized testing. 
take standardized testing with a grain of salt, but I, if you're walking around with your eyes open in the world, I'm pretty sure you can see people aren't smarter than they used to be kind of heading in the opposite direction. Um, global distractions, things, you know, social media, having a cell phone 24 seven definitely doesn't <clears throat> help the cause. And I just think the United States in woke culture is a laughing stock. Um, you know, you look at China for an example, maybe not the best one, but their education is far superior most asian middle eastern cultures heavily focus on mathematics and science because that's what gets you places in the world that's what makes the world a better place not what do you identify as today and even our own u.s department of defense has been focusing in on you know uh, gender terms or what do you want to be identified as that shouldn't be a focus of the department of defense <laughs> you know and i think putin's a bad person but i think that you know he him stating in one of his speeches about like what is the u.s doing you know and not even necessarily the western ideology because throughout history it's brought negative things like slavery and I globalized that colonialism clearly globalized that but western ideology also brought freedoms right not necessarily equal outcome but throughout history equal opportunity right if you put your mind to it you can do a whole lot and don't don't victimize yourself Right. Just because, you know, you may have specific characteristics, you know, oh, I'll never get that because of this, this, and this. I'm oppressed because this, this, and this. So this person clearly will be chosen because of this, this, and this, whatever it may be. If you're victimizing yourself, you're never going to have the outcome that you want. I don't know. I think woke, co woke culture is killing society. It's splitting society. Well, I want to I wanna kind of do some counter arguments to what, what Tim was saying just for argument's sake. So just so we have, because we have to have both sides of the spectrum, right? So I want to I wanna go into detail. I wrote down some of the stuff that you just brought no up. Just no name Tim. calling. No name calling. That's not what this, this podcast is about. So this is just my interpretation of what you said versus what I'd like to add to the story as well. Now, first thing we started off with was Antifa and BLM and some of these organizations that are corrupt. And I'm not saying that they aren't. They very likely could be because anytime an organization gets that large, corruption is going to follow. And that tends to be the same case. We see the same thing with the NRA and several conservative groups just like this. We see it all the time. And that's a, that's an organizational issue. And that's, a, that's an issue with how the capitalistic market works, unfortunately. If there's capitalism, there's going to be corruption at some level. It's just going to be the way it is. It's not going to be as much as in a socialist environment, but it's going to be the problem. Um, in terms of wokeness and education, you brought up the idea of teaching kids uh, sexual education younger and younger. Well, here's the issue. We kind of have to. Because kids grow up in an environment where they can they know about this stuff way earlier than we did. It's all on the internet. They see it all the time. They're gonna have to learn about it. So you're gonna kid you're gonna teach these kids earlier and earlier. And it's not like all of a sudden we teach these kids and all of a sudden teen pregnancy is on the rise. We're not in a situation where we're teaching them sex too early and now they're just boning and making babies when they shouldn't be. That's not really what's happening. That's not what the data is showing. Um, in terms of teaching uh, diversified things, I mean, here's the thing about America. America holds the number one resource in the world that gives us the power that we have, and it's called and it's culture. We set the cultural standard. The rest of the world follows us. We, that's why these other countries will never surpass the United States. Nobody looks at Chinese culture and says, yeah, that's what I want. Everybody wants to be Americanized. Everybody wants to have the American culture where they live. That's what they want. 
and we set that standard. Um, in terms of countries like, um, you know, you have all these world readers scoffing at us. Let them scoff. Their country's burning. The 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 Russian economy is in shambles. He's he might be in power now, but he's done too much damage to even. He's gonna he's gonna take Putin's gonna take the uh, old Stalin method of disappearing out of nowhere because he's not gonna be in power any much longer if the things go the way they are. China's economy is in shambles. So it, we think China is this amazing power. It, they really are not. Their housing market is tanking. Their economy is tanking. They have maybe ten years left before they hit a major recession that they might ever, they might never come back from. Um, our, what we decide as a culture here in America makes a difference around the world, and that's why we have the influence that we do. Now, in terms of wokeness and having sensitivity and having things, we have to have that just because there are different things showing up in the world. And I mean, when we were growing up, we never worried about uh, you know, we never knew about LGBTQ or trans rights or any of that. But as we get older, those become more and more staple issues in the world that we have to take into account. I mean, these people are human. If we're living in a global society, in a society where we want to acknowledge everyone and everyone is, has fair rights, these people also deserve those rights. And unfortunately, when it comes to gaining rights, it's always come following a violent effect. The riots. There's always been a riot before some change has actually come into place. It's always been forced by some type of action. It doesn't come peacefully. It rarely comes peacefully. No major change in the United States has ever come without having some sort of physical altercation or actual violence occur. Because that's when the government has to take people seriously. When they realize that people are no longer messing about, they want change and they need something done to to help them or to help to help the situation that they're in. So... You know, riots will happen. That's part of society. That's part of society growing and part of society changing. That's that. I don't think that has anything to do with woke culture. That has more to do with how society functions. And that's with every society in any part of the world. Always going to have a riot if if things get that bad. And then either they the riot gets crushed or the government changes and the riot dissipates. That's just the strength of the people. So I just wanted to go in and to give my five cents on that. What did you say, Gooch? Well, the first thing is I agree with Tim. Um, although I think the pronouns is more of a respect thing and I'm okay with it <clears throat> now. I wasn't sure how I felt about it probably a couple of years ago. But now with the pronouns thing, it's just a respect thing. But I'm also not your echo chamber where I have to make you feel... <clears throat> where I don't have to make you feel like safe. Um, oh God, how am I going to say this? It's not my job to tiptoe around your triggers, right? So like, I don't know that you were molested by your stepdad, right? <clears throat> and uh, although in a workplace environment, there shouldn't ever be any kind of a joke or insinuation uh, that should come up as far as that's concerned. I'll say just in good company, right? Friends sitting on the couch hanging out. I don't know that that happened. It's not my job to worry about it either. So, yeah, I, I don't know what else to even put on that. That is just, I have a little bit of fogginess too for my sickness. Right, uh, good, man. I mean, <clears throat> oh, hold on. I got to read some of this to you first. So, as far as. <laughs> As far as uh, the education thing, <clears throat> here's a couple of books that uh, parents have wanted banned from elementary schools across the country, and these are the worst ones. Who Will Help Jack Off the Horse? It's about a rabbit trying to get off a horse. Where is my dad? On the front, it's a African-American family. And it's about exactly what you think it's about. A little girl asking her mother where her father is. Now, doesn't that just perpetuate a stereotype? I mean, honestly, why would you even have a book about that? But that's a reality for a lot of kids, though. <clears throat> yeah, but why would you have a freaking book about it, dude? It's the same reason that Sesame Street used to hit on topics about parents going to jail. Same reason that Sesame Street had all these topics that aren't technically kid topics, 
but it helps kids try to understand what's happening to them. It's funny that you said that because here's another one. The night dad went to jail. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now this one's a bunny rabbit though. It's mm-hmm. not an African American family, but yeah. C is for consent. Elementary schools that book was in. These are not high school, middle school, elementary. <clears throat> Why is dad so mad? It touches on alcoholism and things like that. Bye bye binary. It's about a young baby trying to figure out if he is a boy or a girl. <clears throat> Who will make the pancakes? Uh, short story about a young child uh, whose father has multiple women over the course of a week. In an elementary school. <clears throat> so here's the problem. I understand that there are children that do go through that. And I'm sure they need help. And I'm sure it's difficult to ask for help. Or especially when they're at, you're that young. The thing is though, there's no reason to corrupt other children <clears throat> at that age. The time to realize that there's more outside of your sphere of influence is not before your seventh birthday. It's it's probably when you're around 10, when you start going through puberty. That's when you need to start realizing that there's more outside of your life and that they're, like the world is a bigger place, right? <clears throat> it's not the school's job to make kids under the age of 10 realize that there are kids that their dads go to jail, their dads beat their parents, that those kids get molested, that, you know, sexual acts are performed in order to create children. It's just, that's not the school's job. That is not the school's job to teach that. I'm sorry. And there shouldn't be books in the school that even remotely hint at that in an elementary school. Middle school's fine. I understand middle school, puberty, all that stuff, but not elementary school. That's all I got to say about that. Spicy, what did you have to say? I mean, I'll tag on to that because, I mean, I I kind of agree with Gooch in a lot of the sense of that. That, uh, I mean, I think as a society, uh, like I said, you know, as we've gotten more, you know, interested in our own selfish desires slash just concerned about ourselves, not the community, We've kind of lost sight also in lieu of that in protecting the innocence of children. Um, Too many times, I think now that we are imposing adult ideals or adult reasoning onto a child earlier than they're actually able to handle it. Um, I think the preservation of innocence is something that is important in a child and it should be kept as long as possible. I'm not saying keep your child locked up in a broom closet until he gets his letter from Hogwarts, but he, uh, in general, like, I don't think that we need to try to uh, adultify children much earlier than they're able to handle it. Like, we have legal standards for a reason. Like, you can't vote or join the military until you're, well, you can't join the military until you're 17, technically, with parent consent, 18 when you're an adult. You can't vote until you're 18. You can't, currently now, at least in our state, you can't smoke until you're 21. Um, You can't drink until you're 21. Because they've compiled data, they've looked at reasoning capabilities, you know, when do they think societally that this is appropriate ages for things like this. Uh, I know in Michigan, the age of consent for an adult relation for a sexual relationship, I believe is 16. Um, a lot of states have Romeo and Juliet laws when it's, you know, teenagers, not that I'm advocating for like this, but because of the things that happen in society. But I, the... What concerns me is when you have educators or you have adults that rather than being interested in, are they at the appropriate reading comprehension level? Are they able to write good thoughts onto a paper? Are they able to reason their math tables properly? Do they know about some of the basic science that they're supposed to know at this age? That one of their primary concerns is, when is the earliest that I can start basically telling these kids that they are different gender identity, sexual orientations, this is, you know, where babies come from, you know, things that, I mean, for, if if we think back to when we were kids, like, a lot of times we just hung out with other kids, like, it was just what it was, like, they were just another person to us, we we couldn't really reason a lot of these, these concepts in our mind, 
and there is below a certain age and like i think gooch pointed out the age of seven i think that's typically a legal standard for like when a child is considered able to give a testimony at least in certain cases legally um there there's there needs to be a like a hard line in the sand of like there are just a certain ages we don't talk about these things like there's no reason that a child below the age of puberty needs to be learning about sexual education like there is no tangible benefit in my mind that society has for that like it it's kind of kind of to build off what good was saying these spheres in society where like your view of the world your sphere in society or your sphere of influence expands at certain age, certain times like and that's when you're like okay i understand these concepts more so my knowledge of the world grows and like as i step up and i have a little more responsibility my knowledge of the world grows because i now have other things that i can influence in my life there's just a point where i will I'm just gonna have to draw a hard line and say sometimes that there are just certain things being taught to children nowadays or that they are exposed to and this isn't just about the education system there is not enough internet protection for children there's too much ease of access to internet for children which I think is a parental issue which goes into unfortunately the the world is trying to raise kids more than parents are trying to raise kids sometimes nowadays and basically the old adage that if you don't raise your kids you know the the world will do it for you but there's, there comes a time, too, where, like, education is there to educate kids, like, to a certain standard. But it is a parent's job to raise that child. And they, if a parent does not want them exposed to certain things, they have every right to do so. Now, maybe that means that they have to take them to a, a private school. A Maybe they have certain religious values and they want to go to a religious school, such as, like, a Catholic school or, you know, a Jewish school, if that's their religion. But there are just certain things going on nowadays that I think the education system or the government is overstepping its bounds into trying to put certain concepts in front of a child before, in my opinion, they're ready. And sometimes being apparently without the parent's knowledge, and that has been talked about in multiple articles and, and videos that have shown online. So, so here's my counter argument to you then. I mean, back in the day, they used to have books where they did math problems for little kids based on talking about cotton picking Jimmy and how many bags of cotton did Jimmy pick. So that would, nobody, nobody had any issues with that, but society's changed. I mean, I think eventually people had an issue with that. And eventually, so they took yes. the example yeah. out of it. So, so you, you have cases where even back in the day you have these, these schools aren't perfect. Well, could we, we may call it standardized education, but every district, Every school, everyone, my experience going to, uh, to school in Michigan will be vastly different from somebody that's going down in Florida or somebody that's going to school in Texas. This is not fully standardized. So there might be schools that teach certain things that may push the boundaries of what you're doing, but that's just that could be just a fringe case that shows up. But at a certain time, if you're not comfortable with what the school is teaching you, then take your kid out and do homeschooling. You don't get to, if you don't like what's happening, take your kid out of homeschooling and, and put them in homeschooling and take them to private school. Cause there's a, there's a limit. Government's always been involved in this education because it's free. It's government subsidized. If you don't like it, pay for it. That That's what's going to happen. Like you, just... you don't, you don't get to make that choice because there've been like, there's certain levels. So you talk about these kids, the, the books that you, you said, Gooch, the kids that can't relate to those books will have no understanding of it, and that book is going to go over their head. The only kids that that book will actually affect are the kids that are actually going through something like that. Now, where that book was implemented, what if that book was implemented in the inner city schools, where a majority of the kids that are going to that school have a parent or have a parental figure that's in jail? Does that book not have any meaning for them? Versus you take that to uh, a suburban white neighborhood and you teach it there, those kids aren't going to understand what this is about. They never experienced it. But these kids who've seen their parents get locked up, uncles get locked up, like if they're teaching it in those communities, what's the problem with that? And we talk about by whether or not, uh, you know, I, I have a different opinion when it comes to, you know, what is taught in terms of sexual acts and things like that. I, nobody, I don't believe anybody is teaching 
how babies are made in elementary school. Sexual education is more than just how babies are made. Sexual education goes into a lot of health and body changes and things that happen to you. And some kids go through puberty a lot faster than others. Some people are leaving elementary school, going into middle school, already going through the puberty process. So we have to also be wary of that. What's wrong with getting a girl ready for what she thinks is about to come, especially if her parents aren't doing it? Because these schools can't go into your, your, your house and teach you and make sure that your parents are teaching you the stuff. So the school has an obligation to make sure that we're still covering this curriculum. So that way, in case you're deficient at home, we can try to cover it for you. That's all they're trying to do. Okay, so here's the problem though, Raj. The, the ultimate argument here is, is it okay to teach these kids that stuff because they're gonna do it anyways? Is that, is that really what you believe that if you, that they're just gonna do it anyways because in some way, shape or form, they're gonna figure it out? <clears throat> Cause I'm gonna tell you, that's not the experience I had. <laughs> it, this, is not, this is not our neighbor, this is not our youth. We did not grow up like these kids are growing up now. That's not, it's not the same. Like these kids have access to electronics that give them access to the internet from pretty much when they can walk and talk. Every kid, every parent that walks into my bank, their kid has a tablet with them and not like some kiddie play on this tablet. I'm talking about a full on iPad or Samsung tablet. They'll, they, they themselves go on the internet, go to YouTube and look whatever, look up whatever they want. Parent doesn't have to do anything. The kid can do it. And I'm seeing this on a daily basis. So like, I, we just need to understand this is not our world that we grew up in. 20 years ago is a whole different ball game. We had to actually learn. So we had magazines back in the day. Okay. Yeah. It shit's free now. True. It shit's free and it's available on the internet for anything. And here's the thing. You want a te- do you want a teacher in a school teaching this or do you want the kids learning from the internet? That's my question to you. So notice the notice the conundrum they're in, right? This is not a case of oh, we just we just want to do an f you to the parents and teach this anyway. They're battling basically what's so- how society is changing right now, and with that what they have to do is do this early and earlier, so that way these kids that are getting on the internet and learning things, we had a six year old shoot a teacher, brought a gun to school took the gun out and shot a teacher, pointed at her and shot her. Not like he was playing around with it and it accidentally went off. He went off and shot a teacher. These these are not the same kids. These are well, not the same little humans that we were when we were younger. Well, and with a situation like that, I would say that a lot of this comes down to on all of these arguments is the lack of parenting and like the substitution of essentially the internet or somebody else in lieu of the parents. The so that's I think to me that's a societal issue that that there's a lot of basically there's a multifaceted approach to that you're not just going to fix it with one thing. I mean, a six year old is going to typically on most standards have a hard time comprehending the full consequence of what happens if you were to bring a gun and shoot somebody because they may have experienced their their experience with guns may be cartoons something where there's a disconnect from reality the now you do i'm not saying there aren't kids at certain ages that are going to have an issue where you know they are you know disturbed or they're having some issue and they know full well what they're doing like that that can happen obviously but usually a six-year-old is not going to have the same comprehension of the actions that they're taking the consequences that come out of that you know what happens to the person when you shoot them with a bullet you know, like an adult would, or like an older child at a certain point would, they just don't have certain comprehension levels sometimes. You know, obviously kids are sometimes smarter than we give them credit for, but there's still a limit to their foresight, like their ability to think through the whole thing and what's going to result as a, as a cause of their actions. So, I mean, the kid bringing the gun to school, that 100% falls on the parents. That's... You know, that really comes down to the the parent not following certain safety precautions or allowing the kid to have access to it because there's no way that any six-year-old should be able to get the gun. So, I mean, that was the tragedy in and of itself that that should have never happened. Um, <clears throat> and in the sense that 
the like if you don't i mean i agree with the idea that like hey if you don't like the way the public education is going every right to pull your kids out of homeschool go for it go for a private school charter school whatever you think fits better with what you would like your child to learn because ultimately the way your child is raised is up to you um but i to say that parents if they don't like the education system they don't really get to a say in or controlling what's taught in schools i that's what school boards are for and why parents come to those meetings there's absolutely a say that parents should have in the public education sphere you know they started teaching tomorrow what they did back during the era of jim crow and segregation you know are we going to tell them that you know say somebody said nowadays that hey that's fine again you know public education says we're going to start teaching this again are we also going to say at that point that parents you know, if they don't like it, they should just take their kids out and homeschool and they don't have any say in the education realm. I know that that's a very unlikely scenario, but the devil's advocate of like, if they determine that, okay, well, let's go back this route, you know, while well, parents don't really have a say in what's taught in school, so you can take your kids out of school or leave them there. So why, why is, um, so how do we expect these parents that are uncomfortable with the kids being taught this in a school? How are we expecting them to teach this at home? If they're uncomfortable, the kids having this conversation with somebody else that they don't even have to be involved in, why why do we believe that they're going to teach this on their own? And especially so, in a in a in a society where both parents are working full time, because I mean that's what we're in. We we we're in a society where both parents have to work full time to make ends meet and live a comfortable life. Yeah, typically, um, I don't think that it's necessarily the equation of if they're uncomfortable with this being taught by a teacher, they're not going to do it on their own because they're working. I mean, they're, if it's an important conversation they need to have with their children, most parents will find a time. And I think ultimately it is up to the parents when their child learns this information, when like this, you know, people may not have certain information. We come across people in our daily lives all the time. It's like, I didn't know this until I was this age. Well, I knew it when I was this age, you know, I didn't have, this information I didn't learn till much later on because it's just the way that they were raised, whether it was their parents' style of being more conservative and that they held things from them longer until they told them the information. Some parents may be being more like free with the information of like, I'll tell it to you, you do it, it what you will, you know, at an earlier age. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the key is that it is entirely up to the parents to determine important things like that, mm -hmm. that they if a parent is like, I am uncomfortable with my six-year-old child learning about sex education, that that should not happen. You know, that they, they, they're they like, we need the parents' consent to tell them about this. Because back when we were in school, I mean, they're like, hey, we're having this class. You need to get this permission slip signed by your parents. You know, if they have any questions, they can call us. We'll tell them what's being talked about. There's just too many examples nowadays of even if they're like, oh, yeah, we covered this in class. But then parents are like, well, what's the curriculum? And there's been cases where they're just like, well, we don't provide the curriculum to parents. Like, so now most of the time in most districts, I know that you can be like, hey, what's being taught? But there have been increasing numbers of parents going to school board meetings being frustrated because they're like, my kid's coming home with this stuff. And I had no idea that this was even being taught in class or like nobody has communicated that these are the kinds of things that are learning or you have a teacher who maybe is in a subject that has nothing to do with that topic. And so to parents, it feels more of like an agenda of that person trying to bring in what they would like to teach them versus what they're actually paid to teach them. Jimmy. So I'm going to start off with uh, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um. Personally, like, if hot button topics are going to be discussed in school that don't specifically revolve around your core curriculum, parents should be required to be notified, such as sexual education. Prior to the class starting, parents should be notified. Parent has the right on when they want to expose their children to such information. And it is not the school's job to do that. So if the school is going to teach it, they should be required to notify parents prior and have a signed form of the parental consent for their children to receive this information. So that's my base on that 
stuff in particular. Um, as far as uh, especially politically leaning um, in the state of Michigan, now a minor can receive gender affirming care without parental consent because they have determined that a child is of mental capacity to make these long-term life decisions. Um, if a child who is under the age of 18, and this is going to sound like super wild because this fact is actually super wild, if a child under the age of 18 can get gender-affirming care without the consent of a parent, and they are of apparently right mind to make these decisions that can be irreversible why why are we concerned with kids with guns right if they can decide oh, i want to get a sex change or i want to take hormone blockers they don't know what that is they can't comprehend the long-term ramifications of these permanent changes If you start messing with these hormones at a time in which your body physiologically is not prepared for it, you can do long-term damage that can be irreversible. Um, I can't think of her name right now, but uh, Jordan Peterson had a podcast with her, right? She's getting ousted by the trans community, um, so she's 18 or 20 or something right now. Uh, she had a double mastectomy when she was 14 or 15 because it was gender affirming care in Canada. Her therapists were under the state governance as far as legal ob obligations to not question her about her gender, but reinforce it. Uh, she believed that she was a male and this is pre puberty. Um, so she started taking puberty blockers uh, to prevent estrogen formation and female sexual organ development. Ended up getting a double mastectomy. And when she was sitting in some, she was genuinely interested in psychology. So she started college, took some psychology classes and found out more about childhood and adolescence development from psychological and biological aspect of it. And uh, at that point, she realized what she had done and she couldn't go back. When she was 14 years old, she signed a waiver stating that she knew the ramifications of a double mastectomy, that she would not be able to breastfeed a child if she wanted to have a child and if she could have a child because of the hormone blockers that prevented the estrogen from developing her uterus and her eggs and her reproductive cycle. And she realized what she had done at that point. And so now she's working through lawsuits to go against the, because her parents legally under the obligations of the country of Canada had to also support her throughout this transition. Uh, she now regrets it. And she is receiving no help from her therapist surgeons right now she had a nipple tran or she did have a nipple transplant when she had a double mastectomy to try and make her chest look somewhat typical of a human um just without the breast tissue and at her current stage she has to continuously wrap her chest and clean her chest because of the wounds are oozing fluid that will stain her clothing and her bed so these are the real ramifications of a child who cannot comprehend long term effects when they don't have the mental capacity to see that far ahead and I think it's horrific that these are things that are being taught as okay that children can make these decisions. They can't. I wouldn't hand a five-year-old a firearm just as I wouldn't trust a five-year-old to determine, oh, so you're biologically born a male, but you think you're a girl. Hey, let's discuss this. Not, all right, let's stop your hormones. No, if they truly identify as a female in they continue because there was a study that was coincidentally, uh, I believe, out of Canada that the psychologist is now getting ostracized for was that children who experience gender dysphoria 
if you just leave them alone, so this happened in I think the seventies or eighties. If you leave them alone, they will typically align with their gender assigned at birth. As a part of that, about 80% of those who did align with their gender of birth were lesbian or gay, but they were confident in their body because puberty send in all kinds of mixed signals throughout your body and your brain going through all sorts of physical changes. You can't tell left from right half the time and allowing a child to make these decisions who struggles alone in their self identity and who are then receiving gender affirming care for gender dysphoria, as it was once called, but the woke culture removed it from the DSM-5, that it's no longer a mental illness or mental disability as it used to be diagnosed as. So that I just think it's absolutely ridiculous. And some of these books, um, not necessarily the ones that Gooch was talking about, but there are other ones that are explicitly, essentially 50 shades of gray, but for prepudescent teens, right? Going through these sexual activities that are in libraries, most notably, this book was called um, Flamer. It was brought up in the one of the Detroit area schools because of the explicit content and it it was not a party line split on this right there were christians and muslims in the community that went to the school board to fight to get this book removed because and there were republicans and democrats are like no like this this isn't okay to allow in a youth library um so if these things are going to be available, you know, when you were a kid, you'd always kind of snicker when you went to the video store, like, oh, they have that little back corner section, right? All the adult films are in there. I remember like family video had this little like back room that had a curtain across the door, you know, if they're going to have these books provided in public access, because I don't, I don't support banning books, right? People should have free access to whatever book you want to read. But I think there's a an age appropriate and a developmental appropriate level to understanding these books. And then the books like the uh, the ones about kids going to jail and everything. To me, I mean, it's unfortunate that we can't live in a utopian society, but to me, it's unfortunate that we have to have these books because the parents are failing to explain to their children in a way that they can understand it. And that, you know, that's why we have school counselors, guidance counselors, teachers to help kids understand the world around them, not to manipulate and mold their brains to a false understanding of what culture wants, right? That's why Supreme Court justices aren't voted in and they don't have term limits because it is not their job to make decisions based upon what's happening right now today. It's their job to make decisions based upon what has happened historically. And as generations and society changes throughout time, if they all of a sudden made decisions based upon something that happened yesterday, it would absolutely destroy the foundation of the Supreme court. And that's why court rulings are ruled based upon historical things. And if it is a new ruling that let's say there's no lawsuit that was previously brought up on the topic, they do consider what's happening in society and they consider things of what happened historically. You know, grand history can be dark, not always equal for everyone, but that's taken into account. So they're like, oh, this specific group, you know, in this ruling that happened in the early 1800s didn't, you know, it ruled against them for whatever it may be. Just because it ruled against them doesn't mean that the current sitting Supreme Court can't rule the other way, but it's just, I don't know. It's it's frustrating to see, and it's frustrating to see that the manipulation of science through woke culture, right? So you know you have 
gender and sex uh sex is a is a construct or gender is a psychological construct of sex right it's how you identify so maybe to each their own um me personally biologically speaking because uh, even evolutionary speaking you need two sexes right? you have your female sex and you have your male sex and excluding like clownfish and other amphibians and animals that can change their sex based upon the survival of their species i think we're going too far with people um because for instance and this is probably something that would frustrate some communities but i do not agree with this statement as coming from transhub.org.au as the search for um on google can men menstruate it says uh having a period is not a feminine thing and people of all genders menstruate including non-binary people agender people and even plenty of men biologically it is impossible to have a menstrual cycle in a man and this is stuff that's being taught as fact if there's a trans man who no 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 this is not being taught as fact nobody is teaching kids that men can menstruate that's no, not happening this no, is being talking... taught by the internet yes about if you... <laughs> teaching kids this but kids who are questioning mm -hmm. oh can these things happen and then they find these things they're like oh yeah men can menstruate no no, no that's that's men... where the doctor comes into play so you were talking about how these kids can get gender affirming affirming therapy that is true i believe it was with prop three that just passed in michigan but here's the difference it's not like the kid can just walk into a clinic and say yeah i'd like to be a boy and then they just take care of business no you have to go through a panel of doctors a panel of psychologists and then those psychologists all have to agree that this is not a mental issue that she's going through in terms of a traumatic issue that either she was whatever happened to her it, they have to say that okay she honestly believes that it is her right to be a male and that's what she wants to do it's not a simple process and not everyone gets approved this is not but, a you walk into the clinic and you're good to go but she can do it without parental consent yeah, I think the whole goal here, Raj, is that they should just be 18, period. Yeah. I, I can live with that. I can fall. I can live with that. But but here's yeah. the issue with being 18 is that the performative years of a child happen during high school. That's when they transition into adulthood, basically. High school is the social and social point where people transition <laughs> into becoming an adult. But there's society and there's biology. I, I'm not arguing and, with the biological aspect of it. I, I don't believe that you should. Both sides have fucked with science to get whatever thing that they want it, it happens no matter what side of the spectrum that you're on wool culture conservative culture it doesn't matter everybody uses science to their own means to create whatever message they want i don't believe biologically there are two genders for me there's male and female what you decide you are is your personal preference and it's a respect thing if i if i say okay you are if you tell me that you want to be called a man i will call you a man but biologically you were a female if that's what you were before. When the doctors cut you open, you have female anatomy. That's how it works. For me, science is rock solid. It doesn't change based on what your preference is. But we also have to take into account science is not perfect either. And they're trying to create solutions for nuanced things that we never had to deal with before. So when you have a kid that's coming in and saying, I feel like I want to kill myself because I don't feel like I am who I am. And if I can't get this done, then I'm going to find a way to just kill myself because I can't be who I am. What's your option? You want to lock her up? No, put her in a mental therapy, facility? but it's not. <clears throat> it's it's not to give them nobody surgery. gets to this point without therapy not working. No, but it's a therapy should be a thing about exploring why not affirming an irrational mental state. Yeah, but who's affirming? Therapists don't just go in and say, oh, this girl walks in and says, I'm a guy. And they said, yep, you're a guy. Let's go from there. So no, why wouldn't questions. you set it up as like a race? That they, if you're a 14-year-old person, mm -hmm. whoever, 
Set it up as a race. That means in four years, you'll be 18, you can have your surgery. Your birthday is the finish line, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and for four years, you can do whatever the hell you want. I don't care if you wear dresses. I don't care if you, uh, you know, want to strap a banana on the inside of your pants and make you think that you got a schlong. Whatever, dude. They can do whatever the hell they want in school because really they can. Schools don't care anymore as mm -hmm. long as you're not showing cleavage, basically, which that's a whole other topic. But <clears throat> so they can do whatever the heck they want, right? Mm -hmm. So you set it up as a finish line. They go through therapy for four years. And I understand. That's their puberty years. If it's a female that says they're a male, they're going to grow breasts. They're going to have a menstrual cycle, right? And you won't be blocking it. But four years is a long time. It's a lot of development in the head. And even if that was a genetically female person, they're not even fully developed until they're 21. Genetically males aren't even fully developed until they're 25. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I mean, that's that's the issue that they're, I'm not saying one side is right or wrong. For me personally, 18 is the marker for me. I don't consider you to be able to make these decisions until you're 18, but I don't live the life of somebody who feels that confused. I don't live the life of somebody who goes through high school not feeling like I am. But those who... people I truly believe are stuck in echo chambers where all these people are like, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you're the victim. Oh, yada, and yada. And you it's can't a societal do that. pressure. It's well, you have one side of society that's saying that you're wrong, there's something wrong with you, and then you have another part of society that's willing to accept them. So they're going to go towards the side that accepts them. Doesn't matter they're, what the echo chamber the is. The side that accepts them, though, is extremist. When you come up to someone that doesn't <laughs> accept it, I go, whatever, and walk away. Those people that they go and they seek out, they're extremists, and they say, oh, yeah, now you got to do all this other stuff. And that's the woke culture, man. That's the that's the toxicity inside of what could be a good movement, right there. But what 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 are your options? There's not enough moderate people willing to have these conversations. It's one side or another. I think there are enough moderate people, but no one wants to talk to them because <clears throat> both sides are so extreme. Still, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like politics. Everything's so extreme. Most of us here are moderates. Honestly, we have we have a lot of uh, very. Is that right, Tim? <laughs> well, maybe not too. But we have a lot of different views on social uh, things, and we have a yeah. lot of different views on economic things. <clears throat> I The problem is the moderates get drowned out because the voices of the two sides are louder. And when it comes to this particular topic, although, you know, people that have more conservative nature are not without sin, the people that have more of a liberal nature with the woke culture have the louder voices they attack people of influence. They attack figures, uh, public figures, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that they can get a foothold. And then they it's a big deal for a month. And then it's nothing. So, you know, Danny Masterson. Here's a great one. That's someone that we grew up with, right? Watching him in that mm -hmm. seven Danny Masterson, that, that 70s show, Hyde, The Ranch. Okay. Right? We grew up with that guy. Like he was on TV, and uh, <clears throat> he got um, accused of sexual assault by a few females. Mm -hmm. They're going through the court cases right now. Last I heard, it, it actually got thrown out. I don't know if anyone looked it up. I'll have to look it up. <clears throat> but yeah, there was there was no grounds at all. So his life is ruined. He'll never be able to. You know, he couldn't be on the. That 90s reboot, nothing like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, his life is just ruined now because someone decided that they wanted to say that he sexually assaulted them, yet there's no evidence of it, right? And uh, hold on, I'm going to look up the trial real quick. Mm -hmm. You just, it, it, of course, there's going to be stuff like this. It's going to happen. I mean, but there are also cases where people like Larry Nasser come out monsters people like okay but that was a monster yes and truly honestly i get it you should trust your doctors right mm -hmm. <laughs> but he was examining female patients without gloves on you as a female i feel like you would know if somebody had a glove on or not when they're mm -hmm. touching you in certain areas right <clears throat> These how did kids. it go on for that long these are kids too well 
but their were, parents like, for some of these exams were also present in the examination room. I did not know that. I doubt he didn't use gloves for that one, but but it's, these it, uh, this internal mm -hmm. back realignments were happening with some parents inside of the examination room without question. Because they also just believe that, oh, apparently this is just a thing. Until they finally realize that it was not, and then the mm -hmm. university trying to cover it up. Yeah, I mean, there's there's been cases of all over. I mean, Mr. Puddin Pops also got caught. <laughs> there's a lot of people yeah. that got caught up. People, kid, the the late the girls and the the women back in the seventies, eighties, and nineties who couldn't speak up because speaking up meant that your job was gone. Finally, are in a culture where the people they can call out their abusers in well, public. So I guess you know, like the Me Too movement was actually like psychologically interesting. Right. Mm -hmm. So the impact that the Me Too movement has had has actually decreased the amount of teenage sex. Right. A part mm -hmm. of that in society, because, oh, if I do this, like teens are dumb, but they're also smart. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, teens can be clever, but they realize that, oh, if if I have sex with this girl. Right. And then, you know, it's cool. Like you're in high school having sex you go tell your buddies and then she gets pissed off and says he raped me no it's definitely a stressor for us too i mean when we were when like when we were in our date right? like when we were dating and stuff and we're going meeting people like it's always a stress yeah. what, what if you break up and then they get they have some you know red flags about them and they go and say oh I, so and so raped me or you know i was under the influence so i couldn't make xyz decisions when mm -hmm. these behaviors occurred yeah but without proof nothing's going to happen and if they're lying about it then they go to prison not no not they do not yeah yes they do there's laws Women have now. a lot of power mm -hmm. in ruining a man's future so masterson was a mistrial just a mistrial, so yep. yeah, so it wasn't a, it wasn't like he was let go. It was just a mistrial, but, probably. But the accusations never going away. His life is ruined, and we don't know if they were all true. And there the are jury of his peers, apparently, were split and didn't all agree that they were true. Yeah, so it was split. Unfortunately, that's how court see, works, especially when you're a big shot celebrity. Is yeah, it so, unfortunate though? So things like yeah, that. I mean. You're, you're so who's with... it unfortunate for? Is it for unfortunate him. for the for why is the well it was a mistrial he got off, so he's he walks free. They could no but, no but his reputation's hurt like you said. His oh reputation's yeah. hurt. But but if those girls actually were sexually assaulted, that's mm -hmm. messed up, right? Yes. And then you have to run it again. They have to fight for a second <clears throat> trial. But if they weren't, then this was the correct outcome. It's here's the so issue. here's oh. the issue with these cases though. When something happens years ago. There's not going to be evidence. It's going to be he said, she said, texts or images or whatever they could pull up. That's it. There's no DNA. And, These people didn't get rape kits done. And historically, the courts rule in favor of the female. Yeah, but that's, that's the bias they, of human beings, but still. What is the penalty? I mean, you get perjury, isn't it? But Is oh, perjury no, I mean, lying can, before? You might you not, you. dude. Honestly, you might not. That so one girl that ruined that one kid, that high school football star's life, <clears throat> and then she came out 20 years later and said that he didn't actually do anything to me. So essentially, there is no penalty to assign to somebody that I'm aware of unless you charge them with filing a false police report. Um, that could be a penalty if it's found that the woman lied. Um, it's, it's called uh, wasting police time and perverting the course of justice. It's Those essentially filing a false report. Yeah. So essentially filing a false police report, or if you testified something that was determined to be false in a trial, you could be found guilty of perjury. Um, but those are the only penalties right now. There's no specific enhanced penalty for filing a false rape allegation or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's it's kind of one of those things where, so like you said early on, the concept of Me Too, of people being able to speak up against abusers, is good in its own right. 
mm-hmm. you know, the casting couch culture in Hollywood that everybody knows exists, where basically things were done or acts for promises of roles or all these other things, you know, the whole uh, Harvey Weinstein issues and stuff going on. Mm-hmm. You know, that that culture, unfortunately, was pervasive and it probably still is today. You know, just because this stuff got brought to light doesn't mean it goes away because you have to have people that are willing to talk about it. Um, but and so the the idea of being able to be comfortable bringing forward the allegations of it happened to you totally go with that. You know, mm-hmm. the the notion of believe well, all women that goes with a caveat um, and it's not just women that are assaulted. There are men who are assaulted as well. I mean, you know, that's obviously it's not as publicized. It may not happen as frequently, but men can be assaulted as well. It's not exclusive. Um, it's it's the rates in which it, it happens. I think over the course of history, correct. Men have been the aggressors in most of these. Oh cases. yeah. Don't get me wrong. And I mean, over if, you, 90%, if you look at, if you look at like, sexual assaults, you're not going to find that there are more assaults against men than women. No, it's just not um, going to be that way. No. And so that's why when I say women, like it's because that's the vast majority of like the assaults that are reported. I mean, the for, for the longest time in this country, and I mean, even in some countries now, you could rape your wife and sh- you were legally allowed to do so. Correct. And then she was your wife. Changed. Yeah. So like there, there are things that have been in place for a long time as a society where men have all the, had all the power and they've abused it. So now it's getting to the point where the women have all the power and now they feel like they can abuse it now too to get back at men. And that's what it feels like with a lot of the woke movement and Me Too movement. But the issue is when you abuse that power, you take away from the women that actually have been abused and need the need yeah, that power to wield. Every time there's a false allegation that's proven to be false, you know, it takes credibility away from actual allegations that come out. Mm -hmm. Um, And the whole, I don't like blanket statements, like, you know, just believe everybody at face value, because obviously it's not that you believe everybody, it's that you take the allegations seriously and then you do your due diligence and investigation to see if you can find evidence to corroborate. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, that's the due diligence of the legal system, police, lawyers, But these are just hard cases to do, especially if it didn't happen immediately. If there wasn't a rape kit or anything done, there's nothing you can do. The thing is, I mean, the psychological impacts that go through, like, somebody who's been abused, um, somebody who is a victim of an assault, the psychological impacts there, you know, the shame, guilt, anything else. And I, and I, obviously, you know, these are tough situations for anyone involved. These are, like you said, tough cases because somebody may not report right away. They may not get the confidence to report until a week or two later. Um, and like you said, when there is a lack of evidence, it is very difficult because essentially it is a, he said, she said, it is a word of mouth. There's not a lot of corroborating evidence to go forward with it. Obviously technology and crime investigations has gotten a lot better. Um, but there's still always going to be limitations and, you know, there's going to be trials that happen every day that, you know, the person who did it, you know, gets prosecuted and convicted, but then they may walk because there wasn't enough evidence. Not necessarily that people were convinced that they didn't do it, but that there wasn't enough to meet the burden of proof that they could prosecute mm-hmm. and convict them on it. So and, I got I have something here that just because we talked about the, the the allegations of what it can cost a woman for filing a, a false claim. Um, in some countries or some states like California and stuff, it's a six month and six months in county jail for false allegation. In Michigan, it's 20 years in prison. So in Michigan, if you do a false claim and you're proven to be submitting a false claim, you spend 20 years in prison. Specifically so, for a sexual assault? For false claim of sexual assault. The problem well, is the that, prosecutor has to go after it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad that Michigan has made this step forward in that. Uh, for the longest time, people were saying that if you knowingly make a false allegation, especially of that nature, because of the damage to reputations, because of all the time and resources that you've put into it, because of all of the damage that it can do, mm-hmm. then the woman should pay the exact same penalty as the man would have. Here's the thing. The prosecutor is going to want to do it because it saves face for him too. If a court case goes out and it's proved that that was a false claim, he's going to want to double down and get her to go to prison. Well, hundred percent. I think yeah. if you do make that false report and it's provable and you can be charged with it, you absolutely should be charged with it. And I don't, I don't care about any, if you do a, a false claim and it's proven to be false, 20 years in prison, just go leave society. I'm done with you. Cause not only have you negated all the work that's being put in place to protect actual victims, you're now trying to ruin the life of an innocent person and put him on a sexual registry, which basically ruins everything he can do with his life. So 
I don't have any out of sympathy for you. Go straight to prison. Well, and obviously, you know, a lot of our, a lot of our like kind of talk on woke culture right now has revolved around, um, you know, obviously with juveniles, with the education system, you know, with uh, the sexual education, the the gender identity, that kind of stuff. You know, we've talked about now into the, like the uh, a little bit of the Me Too, the the allegations uh, involved with that. Um, so, I mean, I guess, what do you guys think are some other areas in where wool culture is kind of taking over in society? Public policy, bro. Public policy, in what sense? <clears throat> so, a lot of these, uh, uh, I guess I'll just call them woke extremists would be the best way to say it. Um, generally have a socialist view on things, right? <clears throat> And so um, we see things like, uh, ooh, what's it called? Chad in Portland? Is that what it is? Chaz. 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 Well, no, they had to change it from Chaz because there was a legal connotation when you call yourself an autonomous zone that they had to change. Oh. Gotcha. So <laughs> whatever they call Chad, it now. I think. Whatever they call it now. Um, you know. That's literally the echo chamber that we were talking about, right? So those people mm -hmm. decided that they have public policies that they want implemented. <clears throat> they took over an entire section of a city, which mm -hmm. is domestic terrorism, um, and then set those policies in place. And in like the first week, I think the mayor of that place raped somebody. Seriously, like legitimately. <clears throat> and then uh, they have shootings all the time. And then they get mad that the police don't respond. And the police are like... That's an anarchist state. That's not even like an independent. It just basically becomes an anarchical society where ever, there's no rules, no actual legal matter. Well, you know what they're doing, right? Mm. I was laughing so hard when I saw this. <clears throat> so like the U.S. Marshals and stuff, basically they have like unmarked vehicles just parked around there. And whenever mm -hmm. these people basically walk out of the autonomous zone, they just take them down. <laughs> <laughs> they're just arresting them slowly like you might wake up one morning and like half your friends are gone because they went out to go scavenge for food <laughs> like raiders of the lost ark or something it was tarkov bro that was yeah, tarkov, tarkov. Bro. <laughs> the, and the u.s marshals are taking them down the u.s Reminders. marshals are the USEC. they're just going in <laughs> so my understanding of that is it's not a thing anymore they dismantled that a long time ago here mm -hmm. Um, they, cause the issue was, yeah, they were facing that when they set this up, they were not allowing emergency vehicles through the blockade. So if they had like a shooting or something like that. They were like, Hey, they're telling these people, Hey, you got to come help them. And yet they were not allowing police or first responders to come in and assist because the whole thing was founded on anti-police, yep. you know, that kind of deal there. And so they were trying to reach out for like, international aid for like food and water and stuff like that because they wanted to declare themselves an independent zone and like you said i mean it's an anarchist state it's domestic terrorism at its finest um but i think where the important distinction to make with what you said that with public policy where wokeness is coming in that the people in the government positions in that city allowed it to happen as long as they did every bit of negativity that happened in that area that they took over is squarely on their shoulders because they allowed it to continue no i think i think they wanted it to continue because here's the thing what they proved without police ems law and order it turns into that and that's all they did they didn't have to do anything they they proved their own point against them true well to a point but except for the fact that there's been articles on like especially like portland seattle like some major metropolitan cities like that that they're like i don't want to say their commissioner board or like their um it's got like their city commission and stuff like that they are entirely for the policies of like less intrusion from the police less funding all this other stuff basically to limit the actions and stuff that they can take and so on the one hand, you had some people that are like, yeah, let this be a thought experiment or let this be an experiment to show this is exactly what happens when you don't have those kinds of first responders out there on the road. But mm -hmm. the other ones were just like, man, they're really making a stand. Like they're they're basically like putting it to the system and saying like, this is what we want. 
I mean, it can be what you want, but we saw from the outside looking in, we saw exactly what happens when there's no law and order. Oh, it was a total yeah. mess. Mm -hmm. the... And it didn't take very long. It all took like a couple days for everything to fall apart. Like, Yeah, and I think kind of to tag on to the, the beginning of the argument, because I mean, I know we've been kind of around the loop here and we've been talking about some of these topics for a while. Um, wokeness in itself nowadays is the basis for a lot of organizations and a lot of groups to try to garner support because I think there's a sense that if you're not for social justice causes or if you're not actively participating in it, then you're against it and you're a part of the problem in the sense that, oh, hey, if you don't donate to our organization or you don't help out with this, then you must be exactly the opposite and you're the people that we need to be worried about and go against. And so there's this draw from these organizations that unfortunately, even if they had a good founding message, like we talked about in the beginning with a couple of them, they're, it is a miscarriage of what is supposed to be done. Like, I mean, a perfect example. I mean, there were so many, there's a few different interviews I've seen online of people just going across the streets in these neighborhoods asking people, hey, you know, BLM, are you for the organization? And these people are in the neighborhoods are like, absolutely not. And they're like, why? What's the reasoning? And their biggest thing that they said was when you have articles that come out about like one of the founding members of that organization buying these multi-million dollar mansions, you know, by using funds from these, a lot of people are like, I haven't seen a single penny of that reinvested into our neighborhood. Yeah. So it's it essentially turned into this big Ponzi scheme of donate all this money. So these individuals got rich, but there was actually no government or not government, no community reinvestment in any resources, or at least not on any widespread scale that anybody can see tangibly right now. Mm -hmm. When did it become a good idea to market? Like you were talking about spicy, like polit pol uh, politicians and some of these bigger companies. When did it become the better <clears throat> idea to market towards the minority? When you market, you market towards a majority of your consumer. I mean, and I think a lot of this woke culture, some of the things that, are being pushed for these bigger companies pushes away their their normal consumer well and i i agree because i think that what we're seeing a lot in some of these organizations is these kind of woke ideals these like political agendas that they're pushing in their marketing um first of all in my opinion it's just a bad idea as a business because you're going to ostracize some portion of your your base that you're in the for most organization for most businesses you're in the business of producing a good or service like that is solely what you're there for i could care less what your top executives initial political views are or their individual beliefs uh, because i, I kind of just want to buy coffee that's what i'm here for <laughs> so uh, it's one of those things where i think it goes back to what you were saying that sometimes one group even if they are a smaller group of people a minority group of people um in society that sometimes they're the voices are the loudest because they're screaming at people they're shouting them down they're trying to cancel them i mean you mentioned it earlier guys like cancel culture is is huge nowadays you know i don't like your opinion so instead of me taking the responsibility of trying to manage my own offense to a situation or my dislike of it it is now, I've now placed the burden of responsibility on other people to be responsible for my feelings, which is not a realistic goal here. We're only in control of our own actions. But the problem is they, they go after these corporations, they try to cancel them, they try to get negative publicity, boycotts, all these things. And so out of fear of that kind of repercussion, because I mean, social media, you get a lot of reach with that. The, they want to curtail to some of these marketing schemes because they are afraid in essentially of the repercussions from those groups it may not be a large group but if you got a loud enough voice and you get it out to enough people you can do some real damage i mean people have been boycotting companies forever and it's and not, not something new boycotting shouldn't happen because mm -hmm. there's definitely appropriate ways to do that or if you don't like something you have mm -hmm. a right to not purchase those goods and services mm -hmm. So they, they put it on the market like we saw there's a video of fair life and how they treat their animals. And this wasn't even a PETA thing. It was just fair life. They're taking these calves from their mothers, like literally clubbing them on the head, breaking their legs, like doing all kinds of messed up shit to animals. I mean, 
you don't need to do that, but that's what they were doing. And it was a whole issue where people didn't want to buy from Fairlife anymore. And that's perfectly fine. And the message went on the, in the internet, the video came out on the internet and their sales tanked. And that's generally what happens with any of these companies. Look, it, it, it happens with both sides of the spectrum. So we have to understand this is not just a left side thing or a right side thing. Both sides take advantage of this. And it's basically, I think, what is it, DeSantis that didn't want to have Disney in in Florida anymore because Disney didn't support whatever he was saying or was against what he was saying. That's too bad. Disney's like half your GDP. It was kind of <laughs> funny when he forced them to comply to Florida OSHA. <laughs> it's just so, a petty thing. Well, and I think he had a val- while he, I mean, obviously, like if you lose Disney, like you're losing, like you said, half of Florida's GDP. Nobody's nobody's coming to Florida after yeah. that. No, very few people are coming to Florida for anything at that point. Mm-hmm. Spring but break. I will, well, mm-hmm. I will say, I think one of the good moves that he did do is kind of, I mean, he he kind of put the screws to Disney in the sense of like, look, you think that you have all this influence over us, which they are a big player in Florida. They're the biggest player in Florida. But they're the special protections and the special ex- accommodations that were afforded to Disney for the longest time essentially allowed them to almost operate like a city state. They have um, their own territory, their own police force yep. that answers to Disney. So they don't you have go their to own, Disney they jail. They don't have their own police. They have security. So they have they have Disney jail. <laughs> Mickey's gonna take you to the slammer, bro. <laughs> so they have yeah, they have a security force. Um, but then they also like at the parks they have actual like the county deputies that come and assist with the park and everything. But uh, the, and I, I agree with the fact that, look, a company, regardless of how big they are, should not enjoy as many special protections and special exemptions that Disney did because it allowed their sphere of influence to start bleeding out into a lot of like other parts of Florida in the sense that, you know, a lot of people in Florida were like, no, like Disney's down for this, but we're not. And this is our state. Like hiding multiple CSC allegations between Disney cruises and employees of those, and well, between employees and visitors within the parks and hotels as well. I mean, don't get me wrong, like this could happen at any organization. I'm not saying that yeah. Disney is like unique in these scenarios because this happens in group organizations all the time. Mm-hmm. Like Raj said before, the bigger an organization gets, the more corruption you're going to find at some level of it. Mm-hmm. Now, it's, do you believe- like Murphy's Law? I mean, it's going to happen if you get happen. more. I want to I wanna put a question out there for you guys in terms of, so we have Antifa and BLM on one side of the woke spectrum. Do you think that QAnon is another spectrum of woke? Yeah, it's conservative woke. It's conservative woke, right? I'd say it is. It's. I feel like it fits more into like conspiracy theory territory. Mm-hmm. Like it's QAnon's a weird group, man. Like I don't even know a ton about Cause, it. Because all Trumpists... Uh, well, let's say QAnon, a major. How do I say this? A lot of Trump, a lot of uh, QAnon conspiracy theories are also Trumpists, but uh, not all Trumpists are QAnon theory conspiracists. Well, I think that's also kind of one of those kind of attacks from the other side too. Like, there's a lot of media outlets that will say that anybody that supports Trump is basically a white supremacist, or there's some kind of QAnon believer. Mm-hmm. um QAnon's a weird group dude like the stuff that they put out there i mean we're talking like lizard people to the center of the earth level weird mm-hmm. uh they're flat earthers like no don't get me level. wrong like they would probably be one of the better examples of like your they're not woke by society's definition um but they are kind of their own like kind of little extremist level group um i haven't heard of anything specifically and maybe i'm just not on the news enough because i mm-hmm. i don't get on the news a ton it stresses me out sometimes but uh what about proud boys and boogaloos so proud boys that's an interesting one because the thing is the proud boy group the way it started was not so i think it currently if i'm not mistaken it's listed as a white supremacist group on the Mm -hmm. federal databases yeah so the proud boy group a lot of that started from i forgot What's that dude's name like Gavin McGinnis? I think. Yeah, uh, he's, McGinnis, you're right. That's yeah, so Gavin, creepy. Gavin McGinnis. Um, he's kind of started that group, and I think I've seen interviews with him that even said that like he's like this group took off in a way I did not expect. He's like I started the group as kind of like a like a political kind of talk group of like these guys that have these same ideals that are like, hey, 
I'm not agreeing with like the Antifa stuff, the other stuff that's going on. It was kind of the other side of the aisle's response to it. But then I think the people just kind of took it and ran with it. Um, I haven't heard of too many incidents of like the Proud Boys being involved in much of anything, mm-hmm. or at least I haven't heard their names in a while. I mean, I've heard Antifa's name in a while either. Um, the because there was it's this kind of like assumption that the proud boys and everybody was a white supremacist group. And maybe there were examples of some people that did say that, but I, I can't just generalize a group like that saying that, Hey, this is what they're about when I don't really know what they're about. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, with Antifa, like you can clearly see people in the black garb running around, you know, fighting people, burning buildings, that kind of stuff. It's like, I can see your actions Mm -hmm. like, and maybe there were on the proud boys level. I, I got to look more of it up. I just personally don't know a ton about it. Mm -hmm. I knew a little bit about the founding of it with Gavin McGinnis's group and how he kind of was telling somebody like, yo, this kind of just morphed into its own thing and I'm not even really involved in it anymore. They just took it and ran with it. Mm -hmm. Boogaloo Boys, I think it's kind of either associated with or similar to Proud Boys or maybe that's the more... I think they're the more liberal version of the Proud Boys. The Boogaloo Boys? I think the Boogaloo Boys are. So if I'm not mistaken, Boogaloo Boys were, they're more like Mm left-leaning, but they're also like left-leaning people that are like, same thing. Second Amendment. Like like Second Amendment, like plate carriers, rifles, all this stuff, Mm -hmm. marching around, doing stuff, and they're doing it legally. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's kind of their response to it. So the funny thing is, boogaloo i looked the word there was a dance back in the day called the electric boogaloo Boogaloo, yeah (laughs) so the electric boogaloo but then all of a sudden this term got coined as like a representation for the impending civil war of the united states between the right and the left everybody's like you ready for the boogaloo boys so did this dance involve you packing a sack and bugging out or what Um, no (laughs) running out of the tent um, I, I have not found a resource for the electric boogaloo, but I've also just didn't want to hurt my eyes with what that might entail. Well, I'll learn it and I'll do it for uh, everybody on the next podcast. Oh, bro. I would love nothing more. The electric boogaloo. Yep. He's like, this Pack is my your dance bags to prepare. And run on out. The nuclear there's even a, uh, <laughs> there's even like an environmentalist company. I think it's called the three percenters that it's basically like eco terrorists that are now showing up. Oh, it's, it's... we've always had eco terrorists, though. Mm-hmm. But these guys are these guys are recruiting directly out of the military. Oh yeah, they'll blow up buildings. They don't care, man. We've See, always had that's, it. We just kind of that's important too. And I think that's important distinction, at least in my mind. If you've got these guys that are like eco terrorists that are blowing things up, that's domestic terrorism. If you've got things like Antifa that are going around assaulting people, causing mass fear and panic, destroying property, all that, that is domestic terrorism. There are, there have been, I would say, probably more examples of conservative groups being labeled as, quote, domestic terrorism groups because of whatever, like, leaning bias. Because conservative has groups have grabbed guns. That's why. Yeah, like, they say, all oh, these are, like, white And the Koreans. Oh, the rooftop Koreans? <laughs> I could do an entire episode on those guys. Those yeah, the dudes. rooftop Koreans are my favorite, man. <laughs> another, but, another another episode of, you know, just riots happening in the world. Yeah, it, oh, exactly. Mm-hmm. And the police just weren't going to help out. And so the Koreans were like, well, we're going to defend our own property because we're not giving it up. Mm-mm. So, But I think there's been more examples of at least more of a propensity to label a conservative group, especially one that presents in an armed fashion, as a domestic terrorist group when there haven't been nearly as many examples of like mass destruction of property mass like rioting physical harm to people like obviously terrorism depending on how you define it you could argue that some form of it is an intimidation factor which could be a type of terrorism but to me you're making a real fine light argument there and there hasn't been as much support uh in a sense obviously like back in the day perfect example kkk totally domestic terrorist group Mm-hmm. like lynchings burning property burning crosses like mass there was an fear entire black town that was burned to the yeah, ground like mass fear and panic like that is about as clear-cut domestic terrorism as you can get a group of second amendment supporting guys that show up in ballistic helmets play carriers rifles slung around their ch- chests with a pistol on their hip basically saying we're not giving up a rise on that second amendment you know we're tired of all this wolf bs like in the stop it siri um She's she's listening to me. And she's losing it right now. 
<laughs> she's just recording everything, just be like straight to but, FBI. Uh, she's like, I found this, and I'm like, I don't want to know what you found with that conversation right now. But no, I mean, to me, that is not a domestic terrorist group, and it's not a white. You can't call somebody a white supremacist. Did group you say Lolita? The, what? No. <laughs> no. That's what Siri's gonna think. Oh yeah, she's like, <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 not that search. <laughs> no, no, no. We're definitely listening, brother. Yeah. yeah, but so to me, like, especially like, a domestic terrorist group, like you have to be able to show like mass destruction of property and violence used against people. Like you, these kinds of actions, like you, to call somebody a white supremacist group, you have to show me what their like their their manifests, like their goal, mission statements, their actions, their statements have shown that are in fact that. Go ahead, so I'm going. Yeah. I was that's just gonna what, what I would have got. enjoyed listening. Well, I mean, what, 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 I want to bring the idea of the riots, right? So I want, I want to kind of get your guys' ideas on what's going. So, do you think a riot is inherently a problem of woke culture, or is it a societal issue? Because I mean, that's a big thing that that we dealt with in the past couple of years. Because I mean, riots have existed for the longest time. The problem is with riots, you get mob mentality. We were literally talking about bystander mentality. Mob yeah. mentality is the same thing. You'll get people drawn into riots that would never, ever, ever in a million years do that. <clears throat> and um, once the riot starts, they get dragged into it because uh, everyone thinks, well, if everyone else is doing it, I can get away with it. And so... You know, it's the idea of not wanting to seem like an outsider and wanting to be yeah, part of the group. Yeah, exactly. And I, we even saw videos of riots where people were starting to break windows and other people in the mob were grabbing them and telling them to stop and pushing them away. I mean, like, this is not like the entire mob went crazy and everyone, like, there was a group of people there that was causing violence. And that, that's going to be a, a majority of a, a, a part of a group. It's going to happen. When when anarchists come out and they're like, ooh, they're doing a riot, let's go break stuff. It's just going to be what what happens. I'm going to say it is unfortunate, but the riots, historical riots that are going to be remembered that come to my head have all been for liberal ideas, right? So the Detroit riots for unions, uh, I can list a million of them for the past three years, quite frankly. So I challenge any of you to figure out a riot that's been for a conservative other than January 6th, which everyone has their own feelings. That, that burning of that entire black town was a riot. Uh, that was a riot. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. So when I think historically... A lot of there's... conservative li riots have happened in the past, not as much in the present, but most acts of aggression in the past have happened from the minorities as a response to something that was done to them. Generally, the aggressors tend to be the conservatives in history. Mm, I disagree with that. I mean, the entire fact of the Confederate States of America was a Democrat ideology over individual states' rights, specifically, you know, slavery. The KKK was founded by the Democrat Party, and throughout history, multiple Democrats were Klan members. That is an undisputable and undeniable fact. Uh, the parties also did not switch. That has been debunked multiple times. It was more of a socioeconomic transition within the country of people moving from one area to another area in which fit their economic or social beliefs of the time historically speaking i mean that's if you're a democrat and you participated in something like that you are not a democrat uh, you're acting as were. a democrat well you're not a new democrat that's the mm -hmm. problem raj there's a what we're living through I mean, right now is a shift between our parties which has happened before right mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you you can look back at u.s history and parties have shifted there was really no such thing as republicans and democrats it was the freaking federalists and the uh and the Democratic Whig party Republicans, right? yeah or the yeah, Whig but... or whatever when the Republican Party was founded in Jackson County, Michigan, it was the abolitionist party. Granted, say, you know, Abraham Lincoln was a good guy, right? I think most people agree with that. Slavery was not at the top of his mind. The emancipation was not at the top of his mind when he was running for president. It just wasn't. Even though the Republican Party was the 
abolitionist party, the Democrats were in full support of slavery. And upon, you know, the end of the civil war and, um, you know, the union coming back together and the Democrats keeping, you know, some aspect of state rights and allowing the Jim Crow era laws to be established in the South that still segregated blacks from whites was a Democrat led thing. Senator Byrd, who was a mentor for our current president and, you know, Joe Biden was a mentor. He's also a mentor for Hillary Clinton. You know what his position was in the Klan? One of the highest positions you could attain. And he was proud of that fact. He was proud of the fact that he was a Klan member. Grant, you say what you want. Oh, people can change throughout history, but it still speaks volumes when demo current Democrat politicians were mentored by a Klan leader. Yeah, but we could also say the same thing about conservatives and how they hung out with Epstein. But Democrats did as well. I mean, Epstein yeah. was a he was a middleman. He was a businessman, literally, right? Not getting into that. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I mean that it is what it is. People on the right and left who are pedophiles who should be in prison, and the list should be released of who it was. I don't. I'm just saying I'm, that I uh, I like my life. I'm currently happy with my life. Uh, if I come up missing tomorrow or you find me dead in a ditch, please inquire. Yeah, I'm yeah. waiting for the FBI agent to knock on our door and <laughs> just know too much. And, yeah. You guys you need to stop now. <laughs> no, right, just... well, go ahead. He's like, they're on to us. We're yeah, coming up on our two hours, so it's yeah. Not... So I mean, yep. like I said, we this is just a conversation with a bunch of friends. We're just talking about um, the woke culture and society as a whole, I think this was a look into the psychology and the sociology of the society that we're in now, just from the viewpoint of ordinary folk. I know Tim has a degree in psychology, and uh, most of us keep tracks on what's going on in the world and what's happening. So we wanted to present our ideas to you guys, and um, you know, I hope you guys enjoyed the two hours of our banter as we talked about some pretty serious topics and we've hopefully kept it lighthearted for you guys so you guys can take bits and pieces about what we talked about and um, kind of have your own conversation with your friends and family the biggest thing when it comes to woke culture is that we cannot let it consume our right to free speech we have to be able to have these free conversations with one another there are countries out there where if you say something wrong you will go to jail that is not this country we are working we want to bring back the type of discourse that the the ideals of this country were founded on, where we can people can sit down, have a beer, talk about things that are going on in the world, go home, and still be friends with the people that they talk to. So that's the whole point of this. We're on season two of this, and hopefully we're conveying that message to you guys. Well, I think it's important, too. I mean, to touch on what you said, you know, free speech, that's the first amendment in our Bill of Rights. Like one of our free speech is our core tenet. I think ultimately it's what our entire kind of fabric is founded upon, um, at least a big portion of it. And you, you, like I said in the beginning, you can't learn and grow if you don't have conflicting ideals and conflicting basic hardships kind of force against your own knowledge and experiences. Uh, you, it, it's necessary for personal growth. I mean, these these scholars and philosophers from ages past, you know, they didn't just surround themselves with people that had the same ideas as them. You know, they wanted to go find people with different ideas and debate them. I think the actual format of debate has been lost on our society. Nobody can, we're losing the ability to critically think into the actual format of like a Socratic method of debate. And so I think it's important to keep that. And honestly, like you said, there's other countries where people are like, no, no, they have free speech. It's like, I think you assume they have free speech because they're a European Western style country or they're Canada, they're very close to us. They don't. They have speech laws where, you, like you said, you can't be jailed and imprisoned. And it's like, in this country, I will be darned if I ever see that day. Because I'm sorry, like, look, somebody can say some of the most hateful things to an individual. I'm not advocating for that. They should not as a good human being. But I am, but legally, they have every right to do it. Like they, there are very few limitations on free speech and they have only been put there because of cases that have come up in the past of like certain times that you cannot say certain things. Best example, like, shouting fire, fire in a crowded theater. You know, they have the mass panic that can ensue because of that. 
But somebody calls you a bad word, somebody calls you something you don't they don't like, or somebody refuses to call you something that you would like, you don't get to tell them what to say. You don't get to put them in jail or get them banned, or God forbid you should basically cancel them or trying to get them fired because they said something that you didn't like. It's like everybody has a right to that. And honestly, that's something that should be vehemently protected and advocated for in this country because the moment that that starts to fall down is when we're in a very bad decline. Does anyone have anything else? USA. No. USA. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Missed it. Is this where we start chanting USA? Today, we have hit 900 followers. Our goal is 2,000 by the end of this season. That means that we have, including this one, 14 more episodes to get there. We can't do it without you guys. So <clears throat> if you guys could let anybody know, uh, mom, dad, brother, sister, best friend, worst friend, love them, hate them, send them our way. We don't care. <laughs> um, <clears throat> other than that, obviously, like, follow, subscribe whatever you can do um, and send us emails. We really appreciate hearing from you guys with no one else having anything else to say. I will wrap it up and say, as always stay ordinary, my friends. As always, everyone, thank you so much for listening to this episode of drunk with questions. Drunk with questions wouldn't be possible without incredibly ordinary individuals such as yourselves. Make sure you join the Drunk With Questions crew every Sunday on your preferred podcast streaming website. Don't forget to like, follow, comment, and subscribe on all of our social media pages. And feel free to reach out to us by email at any time.